welcome everybody. I know we've got a few other people that are uh, planning to hop on, but I like to start on time. So my name is Ellen Minsner. I'm the Director of Inclusion and Advocacy for Community Rowing. Uh, I'm also the High Performance Director for the U.S. Para Rowing Team. And uh, I couldn't be happier to be doing this speaker series. Uh, there's a great bunch of, uh, of topics, uh, past and future, you can find on the Community Rowing website, www.communityrowing.org under speaker series. Uh, but tonight, tonight we have Stephen Dowd, who um, I'm really excited that we can have on here. I can't believe he's still up and awake. He's, he's going to be he's joining us um, from across the pond, as they say. And not only is the time change different, he's fresh off of his uh, uh, four hour first ever global all inclusive rowing challenge to uh, benefit spinal cord injury research. And uh, uh, he's got an incredible story, an incredible bio and resume. And uh, I think we all want to just kind of hear from him uh, to get things going. So I just want to really give you a, a, a welcome and a, and a huge thank you for being with us tonight and for everything that you do. So uh, Steve, thanks for joining us. No, thank you, Ellen. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Really helpful. Yeah, yeah, great. So, uh, you know, maybe you could just uh, tell us a little bit uh, about your story and what it was that prompted you to uh, start this, this crazy, this crazy event. Sure. So, uh, well, first off, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm not sure who's out there yet, but uh, I'm sure we'll learn. And welcome to my world. I'm now in tomorrow, right? So it's what, it's just tick past three minutes into Thursday for me. Uh, it's just gone into midnight. So I'm sat here with my storm, my favourite Stormtrooper mug and a cup of chamomile tea to uh, tell this yarn to you. Um, but effectively, I, um, I am you in many ways. Uh, so I'm sat here in my BMY Mellon branded Cambridge University um, jumper. And the reason it's a BMY Mellon branded one is I used to get a whole bun <laughs> a bunch of merch from BMY Mellon when uh, I was working there as the head of recruitment for investment management. Uh, and that was back in what well, uh, leading up to 2016. So about four years ago, four and a half years ago. And uh, I like I say, I'm you. I'm, I was a regular guy, family, kids, uh, great job. I enjoyed my job, you know, just doing the things that you do. And uh, I, one day I was challenged by one of my team members to do a cycling event for charity. Uh, it was a cycling event called Ride London, which was a hundred mile bike ride. Go around London. They shut down the roads in London, in the middle of London. And you go around all the major landmarks and you go up into a, a, a neighboring county called Surrey and then you come back again. It's about hundred miles, where it is exactly hundred miles as a loop. But I wasn't a rider. I had never really done cycling before, but I used to do this by one of the guys on my team. So I did what self-respecting boys do. And I went out and bought myself the most expensive carbon fiber bike I could find and <laughs> color coded my helmet with my shoes, you know, all the important stuff. You know, made sure that I was uh, covered in lycra and um, started training. And uh, as I was headed down to Dan's house, uh, we were going to do the 10 mile commute into work. Unfortunately, I didn't get there. Uh, on Jul in July, one early morning in July, beautiful day, sun in my hair, uh, kind of or wind in my hair, sun in my face, wonderful day actually, uh, nothing wrong with it in any way, but I didn't see a particular barrier and I didn't get the opportunity to break in time before I hit that barrier. And as I did, I went over the top and I landed on my head and my beautiful color coded helmet saved me from a brain injury, but it didn't save me from breaking my neck. And as I broke my neck, I was instantly paralyzed from the very middle of my neck down and I lost everything, arms, legs, everything in between. And my life changed in a heartbeat. You know, I was a happy-go-lucky guy, you know, wonderful, wonderful life to a broken guy with a broken life in less than a heartbeat, actually. And uh, I was... I was taken off to a hospital in London called St. George's Hospital. And at St. George's, I was given the normal battery of tests that you would have, the, the x-rays, the MRIs, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I was talking to my consultant, obviously completely and utterly in shock with what had happened. I hadn't lost consciousness as well. So I'd been awake throughout this whole experience. Um, and as I was talking to the consultant, he said to me, Steve, your injury is so devastating, we don't know what you're gonna get back, if anything. You could theoretically be driving around in a power chair 
with your mouth for the rest of your life. And at 37 years old, I didn't really want that for me. That's not what I planned. And I didn't want that for my wife and she didn't want it for me either. And we made a very difficult conversation uh, in as much as we looked at what the future might hold. And with a caveat that many people with severe disabilities can live proud, full lives. They can be very achieving and do wonderful things, of course, but every injury is unique and every response to every injury is unique. And my response to that in our response was that I didn't want that for me. So in the space of, a, well, in a very short space of time, probably 10, 15 minutes or so, Helen and I had a conversation about me actually probably leading to end my life. Uh, booking a one-way ticket to Switzerland where they have a clinical dignitas which would assist with suicide in severe cases and calling it a day. Um, the conversation also happened with the consultant very swiftly. And he said, however, which is a great word to hear at that point in the conversation. Uh, however, we are running a clinical intervention, a research trial, which is funded by a group called Wings for Life, a spinal cord injury foundation that I'd never heard of. Um, but they're funding an experimental research trial and we have funds for 50 people to go through that process. Uh, you would potentially be a good candidate for that, the level of injury you've got and the, the fact that we found you so quickly um, this particular trial, we need to act very quickly. So if you did want to get involved, you would be eligible for a place. And if you wanted us to, to give you that place, you'd have to make a decision within the hour. So within about 10 minutes, and I went back and said, okay, I'm in. Yeah, Switzerland's always there, but we have an opportunity now to maybe do something different. There were no promises made. Yeah, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know the, whether I'd get anything back, uh, but it was worth the trial. And, and at the end of the day, I was a head on a pillow at that point with nothing but looking up at ceiling tiles. And so at that level of injury, with that prognosis, that it felt like the only thing really that we could do was to take it with both hands, <laughs> the hands I didn't have, um, and, and try and get something back from it and build a foundation for recovery. 24 hours later, I was in and out of surgery and I'd had this experimental surgery, which was all based around reducing pressure. Uh, so the spinal cord in my case wasn't severed, uh, which is really important. When you sever your spinal cord, uh, that's called a complete injury. And that complete injury, often the prognosis for that is slim to none. Uh, as it stands at the moment, it's very unlikely that people get a lot back, if anything, uh, with a severed spinal cord. In fact, if that had have severed, it was at the level that would have affected my lungs to the point where I would have been alive just long enough for that last breath to have made the world go dark and it be game over. But that didn't happen for me. And, and I ended up with what's called an incomplete injury. So effectively, what I'd done is snap the ligament on the back of my neck, which keeps the stabilized vertebrae in place. And the bones themselves had moved and I'd and sh and sheared into my spinal cord, but not severed it. So I bent and stretched it quite badly. So I ended up with a lot of bruising. And this particular trial was about reducing the bruising as quickly as you possibly can from the point of injury through the use of pressure. Um, so they reduce the pressure in the, in the spinal cord and through drugs um, to try and save as much of that nerve tissue as I could. So like I say, I was in and out of surgery in 24 hours. No one knew what was going to be the future. Yeah, in those 24 hours, I had no sensation still, so it was gonna happen, but we were very hopeful that we would get something back. When I say we, I mean me and my wife, but I also mean me, my wife, my family, my friends. You know, spinal cord injury can happen to anyone at any time. It's totally indiscriminate. It doesn't matter if you're a five-year-old kid or a 90-year-old uh, guy, yeah, it can happen to anyone. Half of them happen in road traffic accidents. Uh, so from that point of view, we're all taking that risk several times a day often. Uh, without even realising that that could potentially be the outcome. And I say those things not to be scaremongering, but just to be in reality. That's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and actually most of them affect guys as well, actually, because <laughs> there's a great paper out there called, um, oh, damn it, I forgot the name of the, the paper, but it's basically, there are more men injured because men are stupid and they do stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much the, the title, almost word for word. Um, 
so yeah, so I got taken off uh, into ICU. I'm in intensive care. After about two days, I'm starting to get some sensation back. Now you can imagine that's incredible, right? I've gone from nothing to starting to get some sensation back. But that sensation, I can only describe as like being on fire. It was absolutely, it was, it was 10 out of 10. It was absolutely horrific. And it went down both arms. It went from my, my neck where the injury was down my chest, down to my waist, nothing below that point. And um, it was like pins and needles that had come on. I could feel it coming on and then it just got more and more intense until it was just like an order of magnitude greater than any pins and needles I've ever had before. Um, absolutely mad. And uh, yes, but, but equally, we adopted the mindset that and very quickly adopted the mindset that, you know what, I, if I'm going to be looking at trying to get something back my whole life, I'm probably never going to get 100% back. So I'll always be less than I was beforehand. So I took the mindset of let's just say I died that day. That's probably what should have happened anyway. So let's just say I died that day. Now I'm at zero. Now being at zero, if I incremental win even if that incremental win means i've gone from can't feel anything to being on fire then that's a step forward yeah that's a step forward in the right direction and hopefully we'll get through it because that would have also been an awful position to be in on a long-term basis but um if we got through it then yeah we're taking directions so that mindset of progression and acceptance was, was really important and celebration celebrating the small wins um so yeah, so we move forwards through that process. And, uh, and as I was there on day two after my injury, I opened one eye because I was in my little world of being on fire. I opened one eye and I said to Helen, my wife, Helen, um, what's 200 days from now? And she said, it's December the 22nd, what is that? And I said, give me Christmas day and I'll be back to normal. And I closed my eye and I went back into my little world of fire. And that became my daily, motivation my north star had been set my gold medal level goal was here uh, as we all know you don't achieve gold medals in one go in one stroke yeah it's, it's turning up to practice every day it's taking stroke by stroke by stroke over and over and over again until eventually you can take the podiums that you want to be on um but much like ellen you know taking taking medals at games isn't done uh, in one fell swoop but equally on the day, all it is, is just one extra stroke, right? Beyond all the training that you've done ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, so I set my gold medal level uh, and I just set hundreds and hundreds of goals on the way. You know, multiple goals a day, tiny, tiny wins. And it all started with a twitch of my left thumb. It just moved like that. I willed it to happen. I was staring at it and asking it to happen a hundred times and failing until eventually it twitched. And you can imagine that moment. Oh my God, that was just super intense. And I thought actually it was a spasm. I still get spasms now, but it was an uncontrolled movement. So I went to do it again and it moved again. And I thought, oh wow, if I can do that, then what else can I do? Hmm. So that became my, my motivation to try and move something else, to try and get something back. Yeah. Um, and kept pushing forwards from there. Something you said that I really want to touch on. I know we have a bunch of other topics we want to talk on, but you know, I wanted to ask you. You you touched on what's kind of like basic, uh, uh, you know, mental training skills. You talked about um, the mindset of acceptance, about kind of talking about the process, having that goal, and the idea of if I can do this, then what next? Now, how, did you did you have an athletic background? I know you were doing cycling as you did this. Like, how how do you think you acquired those skills? Because it's almost very I don't want to say textbook, but um, what was about it prior to your accident that maybe you were able to draw on, or do you feel it was just the 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 intensity of what happened to you that that sort of made you live in the moment and 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 move forward in that way? What, what do you think it was? So there's a bunch of questions in there. So no, I didn't have an athletic background. Um, I, was doing a, I was doing a massive ride for Ride London, but actually I'd never really ridden a bike more than as a kid, knocking around with my friends, right? I'd certainly never done a hundred mile bike ride. 
Um, but I had had a couple of things that happened to me in the past. Um, one was a major financial transaction that went wrong where I bought a house and the global financial crisis happened. And then we, we lost we, we lost over 140,000 pounds in that particular transaction, which was like our life savings and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So, so we've been through that. But I, I think um, there are some skills that you pick up, which are kind of crisis resilience skills that happen at times of crisis. I think, yes, they are textbook. Um, if anything, I would say they're almost cliched sometimes, but I think cliches are cliche for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, they happen to people so often and the responses that people have that work are often so common that that's what makes them cliche, but it also is what makes them powerful. Uh, so I, I'm never willing to kind of offer up some golden ticket of secret sauce that, that I have because I don't think it is that. But I do think you don't know how strong you are until it's your only option. I think you hear about like these mums that push burning cars off their babies and go, how the hell did I do that? I don't even know how it happened. Yeah. I was the same. Right? I was laying on the ground. I'd smash my face into the grip and I'd, I, my face was throbbing. And as I reached up to rub the bit that hurts, which is the most natural thing in the world to do, right? As I reached up, nothing happened. My hand didn't reach my face. In my head, I was controlling my hand, but clearly I had no control of my hand. And then I panic started to set in, but that was the point where you don't know how strong you are till it's your only option. That panic started to set in. And as it started to rise from my chest up to my throat, I remember very clearly remember thinking, stop, that's not gonna help you. So I had to park it to one side and I had to live through that one second and say, right, just get through this second. Okay, I did that. Now just get through this second. I did that and I literally lived my life second by second by second because I had to. Mm. I didn't choose to. I would never choose to. But mm. by being in that moment, that was the only option I had. And I was able to find it within myself. So I think, yes, I had some prior skills. Yes, I had some prior experiences, but I'd never experienced that before. That was super extreme. Yeah. Um, but I was able to draw on some past experiences. So I do think um, you can... Maybe, I mean, maybe this is a great point, to, a great part of the conversation to point it out. I do think you can learn. No, that's wrong. I don't think you can learn to be more resilient. I think you can unlock the resilience that you have at different parts of your life. I think resilience is there. I don't think it's necessarily something you just go and bolt on a few extra bits of resilience. Yeah. But I do think you can practice how to unlock certain types of resilience in certain types of ways and I would always recommend and I, this came to me later but I would recommend doing that in the good times mm -hmm. I would recommend doing that at the times where you're not in a position where you have to use it it's a little bit like rowing training right you get on the erg and you practice rowing you get on the water and you practice racing you practice it so much that when you need it it's second nature it's a muscle memory it's something that you go to you don't, you almost bypass brain because you're able to get there and you're able to get there more quickly than you would do otherwise. And I think resilience can be learned or the, the ways to unlock resilience can be used in a similar pattern. Yeah. I think you can practice those things for sure. Sure, sure. And so take us, if you could, a little bit, because obviously, uh, you know, uh, you had that uh, 200 day goal to, to get to, to Christmas and tell us a little bit about what brought you to there because you certainly wouldn't have been able to undertake this huge global event production soup to nuts. You actually rode the whole thing yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about the, some of the next steps and, and how, how that went and then maybe get into a little bit about why you would conceive of, of an event to, to yes. bring awareness to, to folks that may be impacted like you were. Yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, so I made the promise to Helen that 200 days later I'd be, uh, I'd, I'd be back to normal was my actual promise. It never got there, uh, but 200 days later, Christmas Day, my house, literally 10 yards from where I'm sat right now, uh, I was able to walk the Christmas turkey to our table, and there's a there's a, there's a video of that actually, which I can share if if that's helpful. Um, but yeah, it was a really uh, intense moment where, like I say, I'd made that promise to Helen and that had been my North Star for so long. I'd spent hours and hours from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep every day for, for 200 days, trying to achieve something, you know, whether it just, but only a small goal, only trying to achieve that next goal. Yeah? 
Um, and uh, yeah, and I went through a ton of physio and I went, I was four months in hospital in the end across two different hospitals, uh, breaking out as often as I could, particularly on weekends to try and get some normality in my life. Uh, I even found a great bar that did two for ones and margaritas, which was wonderful. I used to get wheeled around in my wheelchair. Yeah, can you put uh, that address in the chat? I'm sure everyone would like to know uh, how they can get there. Absolutely. And there was another place uh, called Totus that did a fantastic pork chop. So yeah, we were able to uh, get around and then uh, get as much normality back as possible. I mean, yeah, okay, I was massively disabled. And I had huge challenges. No, I still am disabled and I still have huge challenges. But you know what? There's always finer things in life that you can enjoy and and take take pleasure in yeah it's not all just about turning your face to the wall and it's too much for me um and and i understand why people do have that response for sure but that was a response that i couldn't afford to have i had too many promises made to too many people uh, to be able to it was bigger than me yeah, i had to be able to push it forwards i made it bigger than me and that allowed me to push it forwards and i think that was also something else it was a kind of a helpful skill uh, to not be too self-absorbed in it yeah. yeah it was done for others as well yeah. Um, and then talking of doing it for others, I, I'm, I'm fast forwarding through the Rocky montage here, but I ended up doing a, a, a ton of physio, uh, both neurological physio and, and, and massage and strength training and all this sort of stuff. And uh, finally walked this turkey to the table. But then on Boxing Day, I had a day off because I was absolutely knackered. I'd spent 200 days um, trying to, to do this thing. And, and here I was yeah far more advanced than the, the even the stats would suggest that I should be um but I had a day off and it, because Christmas day was almost like my Olympics right I kind of I've been training towards it and then suddenly you do the event and the next day is just the Wednesday yeah how do, <laughs> how do you how do you deal with that right you've been you've spent your whole reason for being has been built up towards this one moment in time and then you, you do it and then it's done uh, and I couldn't do that because now I can only go backwards. So I wanted to, rather than defend my title, I wanted to attack my title. So I built a, an event uh, called uh, 200 Days Challenge, it became known as, because on Boxing Day, before I told my wife, which is a bad order, never do it in this order, but I told my, I told my wife via Facebook um, that, I, as I announced it, that I was going to get back on the same bike that I fell from and I was going to cycle the 100 miles I never got to do because the injury got in the way. And I was going to do it in 200 days from that boxing day. I've been inspired by my own 200 days journey to the Turkey. And in another 200 days, I was going to get back on the same bike that I'd had my injury on. It beat me and I wanted to beat it. So that became my next Rocky montage of five hours a day in physio and an incredibly supportive family. We spent all our money again on, on therapy. And my wife was driving me. I live in Southeast was driving me to southwest london every day so we've been two hours two what two and a half hours in the car every day plus the five hours of physio and massage and strength training and all sorts of stuff uh, for another 200 days um, but 200 days later headquarters i find myself on my turbo trainer i'm still not allowed on my bike from the roads yet my wife and i haven't quite negotiated that one um but i was on my turbo trainer at red bull headquarters and i promised the world i'd do it in six hours and i started cycling and and i, I got through a number of the kind of pace markers that I wanted to hit. And eventually I managed to do my 100 miles and I came in 20 seconds short of the six hours. So it was, uh, it was an incredible event, uh, but it raised a load of money, a load of money for people. It's 37,000 pounds, sorry, 32,000 pounds for that particular event we raised for Wings for Life. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really nice because on the event itself, yes, it was a major achievement for me and I, I could kind of take another big step forward. But for other people to be involved and to see what was happening and to follow the journey, I blogged it for the last hundred days. Every every training step, every smoothie, you know, people got to follow the journey, yeah. and that in itself was uh, I, I got some great messages of inspiration from people that were saying, "You're inspiring me," which in itself inspired me to carry on doing it because uh, again, you, you don't know who you don't know who you're inspiring when you do these things, and that's a good enough reason to carry on as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. so I got the taste for big events I got the taste for challenges I got the taste for helping other people through doing these challenges and being an honest and, and show a window into it what's and all yeah, not just the the good stuff uh, but also the bad stuff I, I still have today I for a long time I had no bladder or bowel continence uh, sexual function was lost uh, all of that stuff um, I'm very lucky that most of that has come back now 
Um, but it was good to be able to share all of it uh, with people. And those that were going through those new stories uh, of their own, where they'd had their own spinal cord injuries or their sons or daughters or partners or people they knew were having that, then I could help them walk through it as well. I'd spend quite a lot of time, not publicly, um, helping those families understand what was happening and, and hopefully give them some, some lights to, to walk towards. So yeah, so I did a few events. I did the, the, uh, the 200 Days Challenge was the cycling event. I did that again the following year called the 100% Challenge where we got 15 watt bikes doing 100 miles, either individually or as teams. Um, I learned to ski for the first time, which was just crazy. I fell over every day for a, every six minutes for about a week, but uh, eventually was able to do a blue run on my own. Um, I learned to run again in a couple of events. And even over lockdown, I became the first quadriplegic to virtually summit Everest on my stairs at home, which was three and a half days of walking up and down my stairs, brain numbingly boring and incredibly painful. Um, but again, it was done with the intention, one, to support another person who was doing it, but also to raise awareness for spinal cord injury, what it means, what it doesn't mean as well. You know, what, by having a spinal cord injury doesn't necessarily mean your life is over. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be dedicated to being in the wheelchair and, and uh, all the kind of cliches that come with spinal cord injuries too. Um, so yeah, so, so that was where they came from. And then when I was at the top of the stairs, that's where the rowing story started. So in reality, I'm 200 days into rowing. I know nothing about rowing. Well, I knew nothing about rowing. I knew nobody in rowing. Um, I used to work for BMW Mellon who sponsored the boat race and obviously the head of the Charles and like most of your guys will know, I'm sure. So I had a connection to, to rowing that way, but I won't, I won't lie, my experiences of rowing weren't particularly great. They were the most elite sport in the world. You had two teams for half an hour once a year, and then you've got to be from a multi-millionaire family before you can even think about it. And my experience is different now. My views are different now, but it wasn't something that I particularly wanted to be involved in even. Um, but I was at the top of the stairs after doing the Everest thing and I was talking to a journalist and she said to me, so what next in that way that journalists do when you've just done something you're incredibly proud of and they, they want to scoop straight over that and focus on the next thing. Um, so I said, well, I, I really like static sports. You know, I've done the cycling event twice now. I've, I've done skiing, which is effectively static. It's just moves underneath you if you're holding the right position. Um, and, uh, and the, the stairs, and the, the Everest thing was on the stairs. So I thought, you know what, I really fancy indoor rowing. Why don't we give that a go? I know nothing about it. I didn't know what that involved. So I decided after a couple of conversations with people, both military types, one was in the RAF, he was climbing up a wall, um, five double-decker buses high. So what's that, 20 meters or so? And he thought he was clipped in. As he bounced, on the flat rock surface, which is the worst first surface to land on. Everything, arms, legs, back, neck, everything. He became tetraplegic or quadriplegic himself. Um, but not only did he not die, but he went on to become an Invictus athlete um, as a cyclist. But he was really into his kayaking, so it was a water sports connection. Um, and then there was another guy who was um, a sniper in Afghanistan, and I heard about him, he was shot through the neck by an enemy sniper and on the way through, the bullet went in one side, out the other side and took his spinal cord with it. And he was also made quadriplegic. But again, 10 years later, he found himself in the GB team for the Dragon Boat squad, but not the Paras. So he was the only disabled person to have been in a non-disabled team representing his country. Absolutely amazing. Fabulous guy called Mark Harding, fantastic story. But what really blew me away about that guy was that I'd heard about uh, over lockdown, whilst we were doing climbing stairs things, he spent 88 consecutive days on a kayak pro erg and he paddled the Atlantic Ocean over 3000 miles. Blew me away. I was like, while I'm watching box sets, this guy's just pushing away for 12 hours a day for three months. Mm -hmm. So we had a conversation. And so there were a couple of things that led me to go, this, Indoor rowing thing, I think, might be interesting. Uh, people can do some incredible things on indoor rowing machines. Uh, again, I know nothing about it. I didn't have one at the time. I knew nothing of what was involved. My, my cycling event was six hours. So I went, well, rowing's probably harder. So <laughs> why don't we just call that four hours? Not really knowing what that meant. But obviously, I'm sure when I say to somebody, particularly those listening right now, do you fancy doing a four-hour erg? There might be a few winces and a few kind of... <laughs> 
deep swallows of excuses. Um, but actually, I sat down with a piece of paper and said, right, let's design the world's biggest something to do with indoor rowing. I don't know what it'll look like, but it'll be big. And whereas I've done other events which were local in nature because they were done from one particular place or they were done in one particular, literally in one particular room at Red Bull headquarters. I said, I want to go bigger than that. I want to go global. I want to see if we can get everybody everywhere to pull together. And that was done with the backdrop really of COVID-19. So with COVID, everyone everywhere is suffering with the very same thing. Right? We all have fear and anxiety and isolation. Uh, I can't have a coffee with my next door neighbor because I'm not allowed to. I'm in the UK right now. And as a result, we are locked down to my house. Yeah, that's as far as we can go. And that's really tough. And I'm sure you guys are in a similar boat, right? It might not quite be as, as locked down as it is here, but, but equally our liberties have been stopped. You know, we can't do the things we want to do in the way we want to do them with the people we want to do them with. So, and that's true across the world. So I thought, well, how can we build something where we can bring everyone together at the same moment in time and do something together that's really constructive at a time when good news is in short supply. And I thought indoor run the ability to do that. So we, what we built, when I say we, I'll talk about it in a second, uh, it started off with me and a piece of paper. Um, it, it quickly became we because there's only so much you can do as one person. Um, but I was able to inspire a couple of people to help me. One in my two in Miami actually, um, and one here in Twickenham as well. And as a very small team, we started to build the world's biggest fully inclusive indoor rowing event for charity that happened live this past weekend and was a four hour erg for everyone everywhere. And uh, as I say, it was a global community event that was just incredible. You know, we had a time, we raised a ton of cash uh, at a time when everything's locked down, you know, charities are not making, people are not going anywhere at the moment. And we had over a thousand people, well, sorry, just under a thousand people uh, row for consecutively 2000 hours sorry, concurrently, as now is between them, which is the equivalent of 83 days. Yeah. And we raised 20,000 yeah. pounds for Wings for Life. And, and it was incredible because um, if, you, if you didn't watch the event and you came onto this to find out what it was about, um, you might think, well, you know, rowing on the rowing machine for four hours is boring. And, and how do you watch somebody row on a rowing machine for four hours? That's boring. Like I'm telling you, you had the most interesting four hour TV show. Uh, I, I am, uh, you know, I was humbled by the rowing that was taking place, but I was really impressed with the, the program that you put together. And, and I know that when you started it, you had some idea that maybe some places could do like a big venue, like, you know, like a community rowing, 50 urns all going together and there's some excitement there. But when you don't have that, it's, it's you know, people erging in their homes your show was, it, it was just great. You wove together clips of the live rowing, motivational tips uh, uh, from, from one of your, your, your doctors, uh, little snippets uh, of you and your story that you just led here, uh, some, some uh, actually fascinating information about the clinical trial that you were part of or that experimental. And as somebody who works with athletes with disabilities, you know, I, I don't know that much about disabilities. I felt informed, I felt inspired, I felt, I, I felt entertained and I really, really loved it. And I, I just know that that was probably as much work as, as training for the, for the four hour uh, physical event as well. And can you maybe tell people a little bit about how hard that must be? And I, I think when you and I spoke earlier, I said, it's, it is a lot like rowing. We train like hours for maybe four seven minute races a season, you know, and, and your production leading up into this, the how to put a show together like that. I can imagine that that was just a Herculean effort of thousands of hours and people and it was awesome. It, it was, thank you. And yeah, no, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. And, uh, and that's the response I was looking for really because I sat down and said, well, if we're gonna do this, in fact, this is probably, the. the little side story to this. Uh, I sat down and said, right, if I'm gonna build a live event, I need people to, with that live event, how are we gonna do that? 
And um, so again, I know nobody in rowing, right? So, but I'm an ex-headhunter, so it's my job to kind of get to know people. Um, so I started picking up the phone to key people, um, people like yourself, in fact, and, uh, and uh, Matt Rostrin that used to work with you guys there at CRI over here now at London East Rowing, and, and a number of the people like Bruce Smith at Hydro and Alex Dunn at Concept2. And But equally, I didn't even know what a Hydro was or what a Concept2 was, right? I had to do all this stuff. Um, but I sort of picked out the key people and then I got a bunch of people together. And as I was thinking about how do we engage people, I thought the obvious thing to do is through technology, right? Everybody's, we've got COVID on the horizon. I kind of, I mean, nobody can claim to know the future, but we can kind of see where this is going, right? We can see that there was going to be lockdowns coming. We could, we're on lockdown three now. I never thought that, but I did think lockdown two might happen. So I wanted to build an event that would be future-proof with the idea that people would maybe not be able to meet in venues. So how do you build something where people can do it together, but not be together? And that was a conundrum that actually is only answered by technology. Everybody's got these, everyone's got a tablet or a phone or something that you can do. So I started talking to, in fact, I pulled together time team and crew and a bunch of the other guys that are out there. So all the heads of business, Luden, uh, put them all in a there and said, right, guys, this is what I want to achieve. How do we do that? And knowing full well that they're all massive competitors in that market as well. So there's a few, there's always gonna be a few fireworks and cloak and dagger stuff, but actually bless all of them. They all were game and they all got on the Zoom call and we had about 12 guys in that call. Uh, and it quickly became clear that it was gonna cost me a quarter of a million dollars and I was gonna to have to spend far more time to build some kind of app or whatever. So that wasn't gonna be an option. And the more I thought about it, actually, the more I thought this isn't a rowing event. This is a global community event. People, it doesn't just involve ergs and stats and strokes per minute and power curves. It involves Bob and Frank and Sue and Jim and how they interact with each other. They just see each other. They don't even need to necessarily interact, but they need to know that they're all doing the same thing at the same time. Knowing that you are and feeling like you are are two very different experiences. So Bob in his man cave or knowing the rest of the world is running at the same time wouldn't be the same as Bob watching everybody else run or everybody else watching Bob run. So that's why we decided that we were going to live stream it. Uh, and you're right, it was Herculean. Uh, it, there were, it was bigger than me. Uh, it's not my skill set. I'm not a live streaming kind of guy at all. I knew nothing about it. So very luckily, I ended up bumping into a company called Beings, uh, who are a live stream company. And I spoke to a fantastic woman there and she said, yeah, I, I see what you want to do. She knows nothing about rowing either. So <laughs> blind leading the blind. Um, she went, no, I see what you want to do. Okay, well, why don't we put together a show that might look something like this? And almost immediately, the thing she drew is what you saw. I mean, with very few tweaks, yep. she just got it. And she understood how to engage people and how to engage people's interest, not just engage their technical side, but engage their emotional side. So if we were going to build a really interesting program, then we had to have all these connections, these links to people. Um, and I'd done a ton of work around it myself. So I had a lot of contact anyway. So for instance, the, um, well, the five, the five hour show as it became in the end, because we had an hour of warm up uh, to that show as well, but that's available on YouTube under the Enduro Challenge um, YouTube link. So if you want to go, if you haven't seen it and you want to row to that event, it's there live. You can re-row it right now, right? Um, which I'm, I'm going to do because I've not. I didn't get the clean version. I got the noisy version with a headset, so everyone chatted away. So I'd love to watch the show myself. Um, but yeah, so we did that. But then I also did the podcast, which Ellen, you were a, a guest of, and, and a wonderful guest of, by the way. Um, but you were one of ten. So we had people like Redgrave, um, Sir Steve Redgrave. Uh, we had people like Jody Kidd, the supermodel who. Uh, in a TV show over here called Rock, uh, Don't Rock the Boat, where she spent three and a half weeks rowing up one side of the UK. Um, we had people like Kingsley Ijima, the Nigerian Paralympian that's about to go to Tokyo, hopefully, if, uh, if people like Tokyo. Um, and Naomi Riches, uh, who was a gold medalist in 2012, that uh, is a, a sight impaired rower. And as much as regular people that weren't, disabled as well so it was really important for me for it to be fully inclusive mm -hmm. the brief really was bob the one-armed school kid yeah elsie uh, mm -hmm. the grandma and joe the olympian all on the same team how mm -hmm. do we keep them interested yeah and sure where, this, where it came from 
And I, and I really think that you really nailed that inclusivity just with how you presented those people, like that list of names that, that, uh, that you just ran off, uh, Stephen Redgrave, you know, the, the, the icons of our sport, because they weren't, um, they weren't there um, in all their glory, right? Stephen was like in a t-shirt talking about his own, uh, you know, medical struggles and, and things that, that you just never knew. And, you know, just the fact that all of those people, the, the Paralympian, uh, the average rower, there's some of the icons, like the face recognizable um, uh, people in our sport, they were all on literally equal footing. They all had about the same amount of time. They, they're all just in their living room, like, like everybody else. And I do think in some ways, that's a bit of the beauty of all of us being forced into this technology is uh, you, you see people and they are very real, um, not uh, with all the Hollywood polish and certainly not for the event that you had where people really telling some, some personal, some challenging stories. And I really liked that I could look at the, the family of the young boy uh, who had the spinal cord right next to Stephen Redgrave. And they were both uh, given equal care, attention, and, and prominence in, in the importance of your story. So I just want to take the opportunity to congratulate you on that because I really, really appreciated that. And, and uh, kind of leading into that, are there things that, you know, you find as a benefit because you had to go completely technology focused? Like, you know, did you find that there were things that you maybe initially had hoped for the big venue and then, wow, I'm really glad we did it this way because of X. Were there any moments like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we'd originally designed, uh, well, I, this is before I, so me and the dining room table and the sheet of paper, uh, I'd originally designed it to be what I did refer to as macro venue. Obviously the endurance event is called Enduro. Uh, so from a branding point of view, we had macros, uh, which were gonna be venue based rows, picture like a boathouse or a gym, multiple ergs, party atmosphere, and that, and then micros, which would be a man in his man cave, woman in a she shed, pulling away at home. Mm -hmm. um, so they were going to be the two types of ways in which you row. But I, I purposely did it that way because I thought if we lose math because of COVID, then we've still got an event. Yeah. Yeah, there are so many fantastic events that are on paper would be amazing if we could all get out and do them. That will never see the light of day because unfortunately COVID has put pay to a lot of that stuff. You only have to look at things like the um, London New Throwing event which should have happened about now uh, unfortunately it's been pushed back to may and then who knows happening in may you know uh, all the tokyo olympics uh yeah is the tokyo olympics going to happen who knows right should have happened last year is it going to happen this year and, and there's all that sort of stuff. i said if we're going to have an event i don't want to spend 12 hours a day for 200 days which is literally what i did um building an event that no one can do so i need to build something in there which at least we can have a smaller version and that's what it became um, but to answer your question, actually, I discovered almost accidentally, I discovered a fantastic uh, group of people called Zoom Ergo mm -hmm. and zoomergos.com. If you've not seen it, go and check it out. It literally is everyone everywhere rowing together. I mean, they, it couldn't be more closely aligned. I'd literally designed the thing that they then released. And I, as I came across it, I was like, oh, damn, this is the thing that I, this is like my side project that I don't have time to do. And they've done it and it's really successful. So you've got people like Matthew Pinson and Gillian Lindsay and Johnny Searle. Yeah, incredible. I mean, mostly British. Um, actually, they're not, they're not all British because I introduced a bunch of guys to them so that they could run sessions in Zoom Ergos. So right. I'm quite proud of that. Um, but the people like Lindsay Deshoop, I introduced yeah, Zoom Ergos yeah, so yeah, they could run those sessions. Yeah. Uh, but it meant that there was an internationality that I could bring to them because I was having conversations around the world, uh, but they were very kind of UK GB centered. Um, whereas now they've got people from everywhere, but they were running this thing. And what it is, is literally a Zoom session. It's led by an instructor and that instructor might be a four times gold medalist Olympian, or it might be Bob the PT that's trained to deliver a session that no one's ever heard of and you probably never see him again. But actually, how lovely is how lovely is that? That it's about community. And it comes back to what you said about um, Steve Red, Sir Steve Redgrave, uh, OBE, CBE. Um, actually, he's also just Steve <laughs> to his mates. <laughs> and that's what was really nice, is that we real people to do real stuff. And 
And when real people connect with real people, then real magic happens, I find. When you end up with too much formality and uh, there's kind of an, it's not an equal footing, it's kind of an us and thing. They don't enjoy it as much as you don't really enjoy it. And it's, and it's artificial. Whereas if you can bring people together to just be them and have that authenticity that a Zoom call, like you're calling me from your kitchen, I presume? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah, isn't it lovely that I get to see inside your kitchen? Yeah, there's no yeah. airs and graces. It's just, <laughs> it's Ellen's house. Isn't, and I love that. And this is just my house. Or I, I turn it around so I can have the tell you the logo in the background. But this is just my house. And, and it's really nice to be authentic with that stuff, which I think coming from a corporate world would be on my melon. We didn't, we never had authenticity. It was all about this is the corporate line and this is the corporate polish. And this thing that we put out and everyone has to speak in this way. And, and in fact, we used to talk about corporate language. Whereas actually in reality, people don't really want that. They just want people. And that's what Enduro Challenge delivered was the ability for, we didn't deliver a rowing or just deliver a rowing event. We delivered a unique space where real people could connect with real people, whether they be people in their own family, which maybe they couldn't normally row alongside because they're better or worse than those people. So it's not apples for apples where well, you didn't need to be apples for apples in enduro challenge because it was just about spending time together it wasn't about meters it was all about minutes um through to spending time with new people on things like zoom ergos we ported in a zoom ergos room zoom ergos ran their own room for uh, for enduro challenge and we yeah. ported that in as well so our hosts could pop over there and say hi and get people to wave at them and all that good stuff so yeah it was really fun cool um, I wanted to just uh, remind people if you wanted to ask any questions to just put them in the chat. Uh, we're going to try and uh, get to a few more points that I wanted to make. Um, you know, one, I'm all just a little curious about what we might be able to expect for 2022 without you sort of giving away the farm, so to speak. But uh, will you be back in 2022? And uh, what, what, what can we expect? consider you guys very lucky to be part of the rowing community. I've never met a more competitive group of people, um, but I've also never met um, a more opening, open and, and welcoming group of people either that are so collaborative and collegiate. Not what I expected in rowing at all. I pictured it being quite closed down actually and sort of old school in, its, in its, the way in which it works. I've met one person who was a bit of a insert word here but outside yeah, of that, know that is. <laughs> yeah yeah probably um but outside of that everyone's been incredible and this is this is a, a world without borders everyone has been incredibly um helpful so do i want to come back and do something in the rowing community absolutely i love the i've, I've not yet been on the water um, people tell me if i get on the water i'll totally love it and i'm gonna try it one day i'm sure um but i'm actually really enjoying the connected element for rowing um, which is the one thing that people seem to hate actually is the indoor uh, piece. But uh, I think there's a huge opportunity there, uh, particularly with firms like Hydro uh, from a connected fitness point of view, um, Concept2 less so, um, Water Rower bringing out the Ogata, uh, or in the US, they haven't brought it out over here yet. Uh, but both Hydro, I think Hydro next month come to the UK and I think Ogata are looking to beat to test over here soon. So that connected fitness Peloton style thing, I think is gonna be a big thing for people. So would I like to have access to more people and put new people on rowing machines? Absolutely. Uh, so is there going to be a 2022? Well, we're certainly in conversations. On Thursday, I'm regrouping all of the people that put 2021 together to see who wants in and what roles they want to take and what ideas we want to build out. I've got several, um, and I think they could be bigger than what we had before. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to mention uh, the uh, Wings for Life or Wings of Life? Wings for Life. Wings for Life is the, is the beneficiary of the funds that, that you raised. Um, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to say a little bit about them because I think that even though uh, Enduro, Enduro Challenge is over, there's still ways that people can um, get involved and contribute, is that right? Absolutely, so Enduro Challenge um, fundraising closes night UK time this Friday. So it is still there. If you wanted to get involved, you wanted to check it out, have a look at endurochallenge.com. You'll be able to see some of the information about the, the challenge itself. Um, you can re-row the challenges. As I say, if you go to the YouTube channel, there's a five hour program that you can stick on and row away uh, and check out these things that we've been discussing. 
and see why you might want to contribute. Um, so that would be amazing. And if you do, then thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're making a real difference. Um, Wings for Life as a Spinal Cord Injury Foundation are the group that funded the trial that I benefited from, which is why I'm so, uh, they literally, I, I would literally be an urn on a fireplace if it wasn't for Wings for Life. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you for people like me be able to get back on their feet and, and get their lives back uh, where maybe they might not. There's still no promises, uh, but they have one particular goal, uh, and that is to find a cure for spinal cord injury paralysis. They're not about buying better wheelchairs or adapting people's houses or whatever. There are other charities that do that, and they do that well. Um, Wings for Life has one driving ambition, and that's to find a cure. And they do that by funding the best research or clinical trials wherever it is in the world. So a lot of them happen in the US. They have a US office, actually. Um, they're based out of Austria uh, because they are connected to Red Bull, the drinks company. Um, and Red Bull pay 100% of their operating costs. So one pound of your donation doesn't lose anything in charity leakage to keep the lights on because Red Bull cover that. So one pound donation is one pound of research. Or sorry, one dollar is one dollar of research. There's nothing lost in the middle. And, um, and that's quite unique. So that's a, that's a great reason uh, to know that the money that you're raising is, is going to where you want it to go to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as I say, they, they are funding incredible projects. They've, fu they've funded over 200 projects around the world. They have about 34 or 35 or something happening right now. Um, and they're not all in one line. They, they go right across the board, wherever the cutting edge research is, then they invest in that to try and find the cure for paralysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fabulous. And, um, Stephen, I know you also do other things besides Enduro Challenge. You've got uh, uh, your head-to-head -head podcast, a few other things. Uh, you, you know, how can people stay in touch with, with you and the great work you're doing? I mean, Enduro is just one of the things that you've got going on. Uh, in, incredible uh, motivational speaker. You're an incredible networker. So <laughs> if you need to get connected and you're having trouble, probably uh, uh, whoever you're looking for it must be in your Rolodex somewhere. But um, how can people kind of stay in touch with you after this? Are, are there ways they can follow you on uh, social media or your podcast or how could they do that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the, well, right off the bat, then uh, Stephen at stephendowd.com is my email address. Feel free to get, me, get in touch. Uh, stephendowd.com gives a little bit of a, a background uh, on the story that we've mentioned there not enduro but in terms of my injury and whatnot and then uh, yeah I do uh, keynote speaking from a motivational speaking point of view I focus specifically on challenge uh, force change and resilience they're my sort of areas of expertise um, but yeah it's funny you mentioned the podcast I don't have a podcaster uh, but I have been very lucky to using my networking skills get people uh, engaged in coming onto the podcast Originally, it was designed actually more as a marketing feeding tool to Enduro Challenge. So the vast majority, with the exception of one, yeah, with the exception of one, there are nine rowing related conversations, but it's not all about rowing. It's about challenge, change and resilience. That's the point really is to look at that. But the people that are on it so far have got rowing stories. So you may be interested to have a look through there. Uh, it's only on YouTube. Um, I wasn't professional enough to work out how to turn that into an actual podcast. On podcasting channels uh, so it's quick and dirty on uh, on youtube but yeah have a look through the, the episodes are about 45 minutes so they're kind of bite-sized in terms of podcasts yeah. um yeah and i'd love your feedback as well i'd love to hear what you think about that yeah perfect perfect well uh, i'm totally inspired i want to recognize uh your time because you must be really uh looking forward to getting some sleep I mean, what time are we on now we're about what are we coming up one o'clock one, one o'clock in the morning. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please ask them now. We, we're a small enough group here that we can probably just uh, let you ask rather than uh, type in the chat. So if you wanna just wave hello, but um, otherwise I just wanna express my, my gratitude. Uh, I'm so glad that we, we connected and uh, you know, I really look forward to whatever comes next from, from you and uh, look forward to working with you in whatever way I can in the future. You're doing some really great stuff and uh, for a community that really uh, means a lot to, to me and everybody at CRI. Fantastic, thank you. I've, I've got to ask if I may. Um, so how many do we have online right now? 
Um, and then it's going up like about a eight. dozen or so, something like that, small number, yeah. Perfect. So if those dozen people could go to endurochallenge.com and just register for next year's event. I can't tell you what it is yet, but I want you on board. So go register. Uh, so there's 12 names in the hat. Um, and also I'd love to do the same with CRI. So as we go forwards, I'd love to get CRI involved. Uh, all the people that you have, I know you, you deal with a ton of people. And if they have access to rowing machines, and hopefully next year we uh, might find our way through to a COVID world. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to to offer the opportunity to those people to get involved as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, so let, please let CRI stay in touch with what's happening next on Enduro 2.0. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, Barbara from the chat said, "Amazing story. Thanks for sharing." And you know what else can you really say? Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you. So so much for joining us and uh we will definitely be following endoro challenge oh and you've got an invitation to come row at cri post covid i already told him that yeah, too. thank you we'll, Catherine. We'll get him on the water we'll get him there <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for an excuse to get to boston when i was at bmy mellon obviously boston was a big part of our world and uh, i used to look after europe middle east and africa so i was ex-us so even in the seven years i was there i never actually went across to the states despite working for the bank of new york um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to Boston. I want to come over in the fall. I hear it's amazing. And, yeah, yeah. Um, There's another yeah. big event that goes on in the fall here too. You'll hear about that probably. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So uh, yeah, no, I'd love to take you up, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good night and uh, and uh, stay safe, everybody. See you later.